Next, we have John Whittle, and he's going to talk about aspect-oriented modeling. OK, thanks, John. Um, so just before we start, I just want to say that this is work that we've been doing over the last couple of years now, and some credits to the to following people. A lot of the tooling, obviously, was done by some very good students um, and so forth. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to try, this is kind of a, a talk in multiple parts, in a sense. And it's going to be you know, not delving too much into the technical detail, but feel free to ask any technical questions. Um, so I'm going to start off by just giving a very brief introduction to what aspect-oriented modeling is. And that's specifically aspect-oriented modeling as opposed to aspect-oriented programming. Um, I'm then going to talk about what my kind of evaluation of the current state of the art is in AOM. Um, and then present our particular approach, which is called MATTER, for modeling aspects using transformations, um, which, of course, I'm going to claim um, overcomes the drawbacks of the current state of the art. And then I'm going to talk about some more recent work that we've been doing to um, model some security concerns um, using aspect-oriented modeling as a, as a key component of that. OK. So, what is aspect-oriented modeling? Well, we, we all know that you know, nowadays we're building much larger, much more complex, much more distributed systems. And these very, very large systems have lots of concerns that kind of compete with each other. You know, you've got pervasiveness, you've got security, you've got persistence, you've got uh, you know, auditing and, and tracking, and all, the, all these kinds of um, concerns that you know, these very, very large systems have to deal with. Um, and so aspect-oriented software development is essentially an attempt to modularize those concerns that we can't modularize very well with traditional object-oriented languages. Um, these are called cross-cutting concerns. So you know, security is a good example, because um, if you want to implement um, you know, security, you, you, it might have an effect on multiple different modules. And it's, and it's not easy with uh, you know, traditional techniques to have that, that, that represented in one place. So traditionally, when we talk about um, aspect-oriented software development, um, we note that there's really two fundamental problems that these cross-cutting concerns can cause if they're not handled properly. Um, one is concern scattering, and one is concern tangling. So concern scattering is where you've got one property or one concern that ends up being represented in many different places, you know, in many different modules or in many different objects or in many different UML diagrams, depending on what your representation is. And of course, that's not good because you know, it leads to problems with maintaining and, re and reusing that particular concern. And the other one that's perhaps not as obvious, but it's just as important, is concern tangling. And that's where um, you've got one, one unit of decomposition um, that really contains multiple things. It's really doing multiple things. And, and so if you just look at it, it's kind of hard to see exactly what it's doing, because it's doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so AOSD is, a, is really an attempt to try and avoid these problems of scattering and tangling by, uh, by you know, representing cross-cutting concerns as their own kind of decompositional unit. Um, now, of course, aspect-oriented program is, programming is quite well understood now. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's getting to the point of maturity, and it's, and it's, it's used in industry. Um, but this talk is not about programming. This talk is about modeling. Um, and so I want to make the point that you know, aspects are important not only at the coding level, but also at other stages of the software lifecycle as well. And so by, by modeling here, I'll really, you know, you'll see from my examples later, I'll really be talking about UML models. Um, but you can, you know, you can interpret that word much more generally to mean, you know, requirements and architecture and analysis and design. And there's actually been a whole bunch of work over the last few years in the, in the academic community on how do you best deal with these aspects um, at, at the modeling level. Um, some colleagues of mine at Lancaster, for example, have very much focused on requirements. I've tended to be down, down in this space here. OK, so lots of work. And if I miss anybody's name there, it, it's not a, a personal affront. It's just my kind of stream of consciousness of you know, picking out the, the key players. OK. So, my kind of general argument in, the, in this talk is that there's, there's really been two kinds of approaches to doing aspect-oriented modeling. Um, 
Um, and, and I'll call them the aspect J-like approach and the hyper J-like approach, which has analogies for those of you who know with AOP languages. So in the aspect J-like approach, what, what people essentially try to do is to say, well, you know, aspect J is a very well-known um, aspect-oriented programming language. It has these, this notion of point cuts, and it has these notion of uh, before, after, and around advices. And you know, everybody seems to like it, and it's very popular. So why don't we try and take those concepts and do the same thing that was done for Java code um, at the modeling level, on UML models, for example? So if you were doing this for state charts, for example, you might say, well, what are my point cuts in state charts? Um, and they might be transitions in a state chart. And so that's where I'm allowed to you know, insert or modify behavior. And what would my aspects be? Well, in a kind of similar aspect j like way, you'd say, well, every time a transition fires, I can insert something before, after, and around that transition. So that's, that's kind of one broad class of approaches. The other broad class of approaches is more, is more um, multidimensional, in a sense. So here, what people have done is to say, well, it's really a, a, a broader problem of, of how you compose multiple models. You know, let's suppose that you have two, mod two models, and you, you know, possibly developed by different teams, and you just want to bring them together, and what's the best way to do that? Um, and typically, the way these approaches go is that they have some kind of merge algorithm that will look at the two models and will try have some kind of a similarity metric to say, well, you know, um, this state over here is really the same state as, as that state in that model over there. And so when I merge these things together, what I need to do is to make those two states the same thing. And so they have some criteria for, for saying what it means to be the same. So for example, again, with state charts, you might uh, merge states that have the same name. Um, OK. So the, the, the question becomes, if you, if you look at this fairly large body of work that you, know, you can broadly categorize into these two categories, um, does, it, does it really work in practice? Um, so to try and answer this question, um, I, had two, I had two options. I could sit down in my, in my uh, ivory tower and um, you know, prophesy that, of course, this doesn't work. And of course, you know, I, I will sit and come up with the, the wonderful best solution ever. Um, or I could actually look at some real examples. Um, and you know, although, as an academic, it was very tempting to follow the first path, I decided to follow the second path there and actually look at some real examples. So what we did, in fact, we just really looked at one example. When we looked at some, some real models. These were models that were developed by students and so not you know, um, people working in companies. But we tried to look at the types of aspect composition that you would need in practice. And then we tried to answer the question of whether existing methods are really sufficient or not. Um, it was a study that was specifically focusing on um, aspect-oriented state charts, but that's um, not too important for the purposes of this talk. What, what is important is the results. And the results, as you'll see on the next slide, are based on four categories of compositions that we identified. So these categories of compositions are identified according to how complex the composition is. So in the first category, which is called one-to-one -one state matching, it's where you have two state charts, and um, it turns out that you can just um, apply a simple one-to-one -one matching algorithm on the name of the states and compose them, and you get the result that you want. Um, a little bit more complicated than that is where, for example, one state in one model actually corresponds to multiple states in the other model, and so you've got a kind of many-to-many -many matching between states. Um, Third example is where you know the, the two models are kind of somehow fundamentally inconsistent with each other, and if you really want to merge them together, you kind of have to refactor them in some non-trivial way. And you might have to kind of pull one piece apart and stick it in a particular place in another model, and then put the other, the other piece in some other place. Um, and the fourth category here is what we say that the composition re required new things. So you had two models that were um, developed independently, but when you bring them together, you actually need new behavior or new model elements to make the composition work correctly. So a good example of this is where um, you've got two models that both access the same piece of data. And if you're just looking at each model in isolation, you don't need any synchronization mechanisms. But once you bring them together, you've, got, you've, you've then got you know, access control and synchronization that you need. So you, you need something new. Um, so what we try to answer in this study is you know, how, how common are each of these four types of compositions? And, and as you'll see, the reason why we have these four is because the existing methods for aspect-oriented modeling um, tend to handle um, certain of these category, categories better than others. 
OK. So the results um, look something like this. So for the simplest type of, um, of match here, um, they, the kinds of that kind of composition occurred about 13% you know, of the overall compositions that you had. Um, the slightly more complicated many-to-many -many occurred about 40% of the time. This kind of more refactoring um, idea occurred about 45% of the time. But what's, what's to note here is really the last two columns on this slide. Um, so what we try to answer here, and this is really not very scientific, is you know the hyper J style or the aspect J style. Does that support that particular kind of composition, or does it not? Um, now the hyper J style supports the first type of composition very well because that's really what it was designed for. You know, just some matching criteria and, and plug the two models together. Um, it could potentially be extended to the second category in a, in a kind of fairly natural, intuitive way. So that's what that's got a maybe. But it certainly doesn't. It, it doesn't support the last two categories very well because it doesn't support any type of refactoring of the models. Um, in a different way, the kind of more aspect J style. Um, you know, although you can do the first categories, it, it's not necessarily easy or very natural, whereas the third, third category, um, you, you can do it, but my argument here is that um, if you follow this aspect J style, you tend to end up with very fragmented models because you'll get an aspect-oriented model where you say, well, this bit gets inserted here, this bit gets inserted there, that bit gets inserted there, um, and these, each of these bits are kind of represented as separate models, and so you end up with an aspect model that's kind of a very fragmented thing. Um, which is, is really kind of against the grain of modeling because modeling is supposed to be intuitive. You know, these graphical models, you're just supposed to be able to just look at them and see what's going on. Whereas you, en you end up with some kind of fragmentation there and, and it's, it's no longer easy to see what's going on. Okay. So, um, so, the, so the argument here is that neither of these two approaches are, are quite enough. You know, they, they, they don't quite fit. Um, uh, uh, the aspect J-like approaches only tend to match against single events um, in, in, the, in the base. And also, they only really support sequential weaving because you only, you, 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 they just pick up the advices from aspect J. So you just have before, after, and around. Um, you, you, they don't really support things like merging uh, models together in parallel or merging one model, model as a sub-model of another model, for example. Um, and in Hyper-J, like, what tends to happen is that this default merge algorithm doesn't always work exactly the way you want it to do. And so you have to kind of look at the, the merge model, and then you have to go in and kind of tweak it around a bit. And, and that tweaking can be highly non-trivial. So, so the claim, therefore, is that neither of these are really sufficient for aspect-oriented modeling. Um, so once you kind of get to that point, the next natural question to ask is, well, what, what are really the requirements on, on aspect-oriented modeling? Um, and I think there's, there's really kind of four very broad requirements on, on a model composition language for AOSD. Um, so the first requirement is it should be very expressive. Um, and, I, and I would claim that some of the existing approaches, like the Hyper-J-like approach, are, are not expressive enough. Um, they should, of course, be scalable. That's a, a kind of standard requirement. They should also be intuitive, which means that here that if you're going to produce a model composition language for UML, you shouldn't invent a completely new language or do things in a completely different way because no one's going to use it. You should try and match the underlying modeling language as much as you possibly can. And the final part is that it would be nice if there was some underlying formality to the language that you're developing so that you can kind of... Uh, you know, um, apply existing analysis techniques and, you know, detect things like uh, interactions between aspects automatically. Okay. So the, the conclusion that we came to um, was that, um, you know, aspects are really just, aspect composition is really just another type of uh, model transformation. And so why not use existing technologies that have been developed for model transformation? And so at a very kind of simple level, um, what we we, we just view aspect composition as, um, as a kind of layer on top of graph transformations. So um, in graph transformations, you typically specify a pattern that captures um, points in a, in, a, in a base artifact where you want to, that, you, that you want to modify. And then you write a rule um, that you know, adds new elements or deletes elements from, from that base. Uh, and so this is, this is just a, a, a graph rule. So for us, as I say, you know, an aspect is a graph rule. And in, in, in aspect terms, what you normally would think of as the, as the point cut um, 
is the pattern on the left-hand side of the rule, and then the stuff that you introduce on the right-hand side of the rule um, is what you would normally think of as the aspect and the advice. You know, um, what this, the reason this is quite nice is because it allows you any composition strategy. You're not limited to the usual aspect J-like strategies of before, after, and around. You can compose things in parallel. You can compose substates as, as substates or as submodels. Um, it's also a unified approach because um, you don't have to design a new aspect composition language for each modeling language. You know, um, the current implementation of this that we have supports class diagrams, sequence diagrams, and state charts. But you can do it for any language as long as you've got a well-defined meta model. It works in exactly the same way. Um, and, the, and the third advantage of this is that you can, you can leverage existing techniques for analysis. And as you'll see, the, the one that we've started with here, there's this technique called critical pair analysis um, that's, uh, that's been around in transformation um, languages for a long time. And, and we've used this to automatically detect uh, conflicts between aspects at the modeling level, um, you know, which is a, it's a real problem when you have multiple aspects and they might overlap or interact in undesired ways. OK. So, so our approach is called Matter. It's modeling aspects using a transformation approach. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than just simply using graph transformations for the following reasons. Um, one reason is that it only uses the, the concrete UML syntax. So as I said, we've done this so far for UML sequence diagrams, state charts, and class diagrams. Um, most of the approaches, if you look at the graph transformation literature, write rules at the abstract syntax level, which is um, not very intuitive for you know, real developers. So um, we've limited ourselves to concrete UML syntax, which means it's not a general purpose transformation language, but it, it, it's, it's very well suited for aspects. Um, it also supports a thing called sequence point cuts, which essentially means that instead of just matching against a single event in the base, you can match against context, and you can say, well, I'm interested in a whole sequence of events, and then to do something. And it also supports um, automatic lightweight analysis of interactions between an, uh, aspects uh, via this critical pair analysis technique. Um, there's a real tool to support this. It's currently built um, on top of the commercial tool IBM Rational Software Modeler. OK, so let me just, rather than going into you know, lots of nitty gritty technical details, let me just try to give you a motivating example. Um, so this is, an ex this is going to be an example where we, we, we're developing a system and we have a set of use cases. And we're going to view each use case as an aspect. Um, and this is an idea taken from a, a book by Jacobson and Eng. And, and why do we want to do this? Well, because in traditional object-oriented analysis and design, you start with some use cases, which is a very kind of customer-oriented decomposition. And then you go to an object-oriented decomposition. And in fact, you could, you could argue that one of the, the hardest parts of developing software in this way is to come up with this kind of transformation from the customer-oriented view to the object-oriented view. What you end up with is you end up with you know, each single module kind of implementing um, multiple concerns from multiple use cases. Um, so it's not very easy. You know, you can't look at the code and say, "Oh, yeah, that's that's my use case in one in one decomposed um, point." Um, what Jacobson and Eng say, well, they say, well, maintain the composition of the of the use cases when you go down to the code, um, and they call them use case slices. So you would develop, you know, a, a a set of modules for each particular use case, and then you'd have some kind of relationships that specify how those things go together. Um, so this is a very particular instance of aspect-oriented software development, if you like. Um, where Jacobson and Eng stop is to provide a language for actually doing the composition. And that's where we come in, because we have this language matter. So you can, um, you can specify um, the, the relationships between the various use case slices, both at the behavioral level and at the structural level. OK, and what would it look like? Well, let's take a simple example of, of a cell phone that has three use cases. So it has one use case for receiving a call. Somebody calls you, and what, what happens? Um, it's going to have another use case for, um, for voicemail, you know, taking a message if you don't answer within a certain period of time. And it's going to have a, another one for, um, for 
full call forwarding. Okay. So this is, this is what we're going to consider as the base use case. So following this approach, you would, you know, you have these three use cases and you develop a set of models for each of the use cases. Okay, so, and in this case, we're using class sequence diagram and state charts. So, you know, a call comes in, you display some information, um, you ring, and then you pick up, and then you later hang up, or you can disconnect. And you have a state chart that does a similar thing. You're in the idle state. Um, if an incoming call comes in, you ring, and you go to the waiting state, and so forth. Okay, so that's just regular old UML. Nothing new about that. Um, it gets more interesting when you want to... Um, implement the, the, the aspects or the other use cases. So each of the other use case slices, and we see two here, one in the top and one in the bottom of this diagram, um, each use case slice is implemented as an increment on that base use case slice, so what was on the previous slide. Um, so in the top case, this is where if you don't answer within a certain period of time, in other words, there's a timeout, then you're going to take a message. And notice the special notation where it says create. Um, anything that doesn't say create is basically matched against in the base, and anything that does say create is going to be something new that's introduced. So the create is basically the aspect. Um, what is not marked with create is the, is the point cut, if you're talking about aspect terms. So in the top right-hand corner there, you're, you're essentially saying, you know, match against any two states that have a transition between them with incoming call as the name of that trigger on the transition. And if you find that, then you add a new transition that says, you know, if, if there's a timeout, in other words, if the call's not answered within a certain period of time, then you forward it to voicemail. So what we've, what we've done there is to simply add a new transition to that state machine, okay? That's what we've done. Um, the, doing it for a sequence diagram is very similar, um, except that we have this special any operator, which is uh, a UML interaction fragment, but this any is new, and this will just match against any sequence of messages. Um, so that's what I mean when I say that um, you know it, it's a sequence point. You can't, you, you're not limited to just matching against one event. You can match against the whole sequence of events. So what you're saying in the sequence diagram case is the ring here is the point cut. If you can find ring in the base, then you create an alternative, an alt box, and you add the timeout and the forward to voicemail. If the timeout doesn't occur, however, you need to do whatever you were going to do anyway. And so that's where the any box comes in, because that's matched against all of the previous messages that we had. In other words, it would match against anything below here, um, and that would, just get, that would just get put in. So you get, you get the right behavior with that. Um, the second aspect here is... Um, notify call waiting aspect. So this is if you're already on the phone and somebody tries to call in, um, you want a message that you know, says, you know, somebody's calling, do you want to put them on hold? And this works in the same way. For the state machine on the right, um, what you're matching against here is the state on call. In other words, you're in the middle of a call. And you create a new state waiting for hold prompt. And you're also going to create two new transitions. Um, one that says, if there's an incoming call when you're already on the call, then you display some information. And the other one that gets you back because you, uh, you, you put the new caller on hold. So just to say here that this create um, applies to the state that's created and to these two transitions because they're connected to it. So that's just, just a minor point. And you would do a similar thing with the sequence diagram. Here, it's this whole loop here that's being created. Um, and what you're matching against is two events, pick up and hang up. So here you're saying, I'm only interested in anything that happens in between me picking up and putting the phone down. In other words, I'm, you're interested in when you're actually uh, taking a call. And if you're taking a call and another call comes in, then you do the same thing as before. So these, these are aspects, but they're really, just, um, they're really just a way of representing graph rules. Okay? But, you know, I would hope you would agree that you know this is the, the idea here is to use the uh, underlying modeling language as much as you possibly can, and not introduce a whole new bunch of notations talking about point cuts and advices and all of that stuff. Um, you can you can pretty much use this out of the box if, if you understand UML. Um, one additional advantage of using graph transformations here is that there's this technique called critical pair analysis. Um, now. For those of you who don't know, critical pair analysis is an old technique where you look at um, sets of rules, and you look at a pair of rules, and you try and figure out the way that the rules overlap. 
And if they overlap in some way, it means that you may get a different result depending on which one you apply first. So in the, in the aspect world, that becomes a real issue because you, you might have two aspects. So take a message and notify call waiting in this case, that if you apply one aspect before the other, you get a different model than if you apply them the other way around. Um, and in fact, if, you, if these are the two results you get um, from either applying take a message first or applying notify call waiting um, first. And you get a different result because um, one of them introduces a new incoming call. The notify call waiting introduces a new incoming call and the take a message matches against that incoming call. So obviously if you apply take a message first, then you're not going to match against this because it hasn't been introduced yet. So what essentially ends up happening is that uh, you don't get this extra transition here. And so you can end up designing a phone that says that any call received during an existing call won't be sent to voicemail. So obviously, it's not the result you want. So we, we, we've used this critical pair analysis to automatically analyze um, these aspects as you write them. Um, so the, the, the way you use this is you, you, you develop your aspects. And then you, 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 you ask the system to compose the aspects. And before it does it, it will apply the critical pair analysis. And if there's no problem, it'll go ahead and compose. If there's a problem, it'll come back and say, well, there's some dependencies or there's some conflicts between the aspects. You may need to go back and revisit your models. And you end up getting either, as I said, either dependencies or conflicts. So a dependency is where one aspect is dependent on another one. And this you can just solve by ordering in them in a particular way. But the, the, the critical pair analysis will essentially tell you which order you're supposed to apply them in. And conflicts you get, these can be more serious. These are when one aspect will modify the base model in such a way that another aspect can't apply. So it might delete something that another aspect relies on, for example. Um, this you can sometimes solve using ordering, but in the worst case, you know, it means that there's something funda fundamentally wrong with your design, and you basically need to go back and change your design. Okay. So um, that's, I'm going to skip those actually. That, that's basically a quick overview of, of what Matter is. Um, just to say, that, I mean, as I said, there's a tool. It uses this system called AGG, which is a graph rewriting system as a back end. Um, the other thing it, it can do is it can generate um, aspect-oriented code from these models. Um, it does this in an aspect-oriented way. So it doesn't compose everything together and then generate code. It will take each of the individual model aspects and generate AOP code um, from those. Um, there are actually some interesting research questions in doing that because um, the language that we use for modeling the aspects is much more expressive than is available in existing AOP languages. And so there's a question of how you map that down, but I'm not going to go into that today. Um, what I want to finish off, though, with in the, in the last 10 minutes or so is to just give you a very quick flavor of one of the particular application areas where we've applied this. Um, as you can see, we've, we've, we've applied this in a number of areas. But most recently, we've been looking at how do you model security concerns um, at very, you know, very early stages of the life cycle. And as I, you know, I've mentioned security a couple of times as a kind of obvious um, place where you might use aspects. And we've, we've done some work on applying this matter tool to modeling and weaving together these different security concerns. Um, so this, this particular technique, it's called executable misuse cases. So misuse cases are like use cases, except they're things that you don't want to happen. So they're, they're a very good way of modeling you know, attacks on a system, for example, because you can model a use case, and then you can model a misuse case that threatens um, the successful achievement of that use case. And then you can model a mitigation that will allow that original use case to, in fact, take place despite the attack. Okay? So these, these are a technique that were developed um, early 2000s. Like use cases, though, they're basically just you know, very high-level diagrams. The, the only real way that they differ from use cases is that you have two new relationships, one called threatens and one called mitigates. Um, and instead of um, actors, you have malactors or attackers. Um, and if, if you're using these misuse cases, you know, you would do very similar things than you do with use cases. You'd come up with templates where you write the text. Um, and, you know, they're a nice technique. People find them very easy to use, but there's no, there's no automation to them at all, you know? 
Um, so what we did was um, we came up with a way where you can model these misuse cases in an executable way, okay? So we model the set of use cases as, as, a, as a, a big set of scenarios, um, which happens to be done in, a, in, a, in UML, but UML with a formal semantics, so it's actually executable UML. Um, and the and aspects are used to manage the, um, the aspect-oriented part of it. So, um, what, what we do is that the, the attacks themselves or the potential attacks that your system might come under are modeled as aspects, and then the, the mitigations of the attacks are modeled as aspects as well. And this allows you to keep the attacks and the mitigations very much separately from the rest of the application. Um, another thing it, it allows you to do, um, it, you know, it allows you to follow this process where you come up with a use case model, which is executable, and then you brainstorm um, sets of attacks on that use case model. Um, and then you can, you can apply those attacks um, in the same way that you would apply a set of regression tests. So each time you brainstorm a new attack, you run it on the executable model to see if it will succeed or not. If it succeeds, then you say, okay, I need a new mitigation. So you design an aspect, which is your new mitigation. You then run the attack again to make sure that the mitigation works. And in addition, you run all of the attacks that you had previously um, in the same way that you do regression testing to make sure that you haven't broken anything, you know, any of the previous mitigations or anything like that. So that's, that's the way it works. Um, to give you a, a, just a quick flavor of this, um, this is an example of a kind of the ubiquitous electronic voting system example. It's a very nice example for using in security. Um, it's based on a real system. There's a very nice paper by Kono in 2004 where they look at a real electronic voting system um, and they study it for potential attacks. And what we did, we just went through this, this paper and said, well, you know, could you have modeled these attacks using this executable um, misuse technique? Um, and there's two overall goals of this system. One, obviously, is to maintain voter anonymity, and the other one is to make sure that you actually capture the votes correctly. So if you were doing this um, using our technique, there'd be three use cases that you first of all set up. Um, first of all, you have to set up the voting procedure by sending out details of the candidates to all the polling stations. You then have a use case for doing voting, and then you finally have a use case for you know, wrapping things up and sending the results where they need to go. And the voting is all done using smart cards. Okay? Um, so the voting use case is as you might expect. The voter goes to the polling station, and they show some, show some ID, they get a smart card, and a PIN number, and then they go to the electronic voting machine, they enter their smart card and the PIN, and then they can vote, okay? So you can, you can, mod that, that, you can model the, these particular use cases easily using UML um, and using these things called interaction overview diagrams, okay? So this is what they would look like using our tool. Here you've got three levels of, um, uh, sorry, two levels of interaction overview diagrams. So the, the top one shows the use cases connected by an interaction overview diagram, and then each of the nodes in that top one is refined by a second interaction overview diagram. So voting, you first have to get a smart card, then you have to cast your vote, then you have to return the smart card. And then each of the votes, each of the uh, nodes at the second level are given a sequence diagram. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but just to show you, um, this is the kind of level of detail you would specify in this example. There's just one sequence diagram here for each of the nodes. Um, and this is the main one. This is for casting votes. Um, and I'll just talk about this one a little bit because we're going to see an aspect on top of this. So here, you know, you insert your smart card. It gets checked. Um, you, you get authenticated, and then you submit your vote. And then um, at the end, the card gets disabled so it can't be used again. Um, so if you look at the, um, the original Kono paper on this kind of example, um, they detail 11 different attacks that could take place on this system. So one of them is that the attacker could vote multiple times, and the way that they can do this is they can just manufacture their own smart cards, and they could bring a stack of smart cards to the polling station and go in and just vote for you know, Hillary Clinton multiple times, um, which none of us would want, of course. Um, so, uh, and you, mitig you could mitigate this by um, storing IDs on the smart card so that you would know um, that, the, that the same uh, card hasn't been, hasn't been in used again. Um, note that you're not jeopardizing the voter anonymity there because you're not storing the votes, you're just storing some ID. So, 
using our technique, we've already got the executable set of use cases that captures the behavior of the system. Now we would brainstorm new attacks and model mitigations to those attacks. So here is the attack that we would model. And you, you model not the actual manufacturing of the smart card. You model the, the undesired result um, of the attack, which in this case is to vote multiple times. And you can easily do that using sequence diagrams. You can just refer to the voting um, uh, scenario and say, you know, this shouldn't happen more. This shouldn't happen two times or more. Okay. So if I was to, you know, put this into our tool, I could I could run that attack scenario on the executable use case, and it would work, which would mean that the attack succeeds, which would mean that there's a problem. So what you would then do is to say, well, I'm going to design some mitigation scenarios so that the attack will no longer succeed. And you're going to use this, you're going to do this using aspects. Um, the mitigation, as I said, is to store IDs on the smart card. So you, you need to introduce two aspects, in fact. The first one is that when, you know, in, in the scenario where the vote has given a, a smart card, you need to actually create new messages to store the ID on there. And the second one is that when you actually vote, you need to store new messages to actually check if that ID has been used before or not. Um, so here you can see everything in red is stuff that's part of the aspect. Um, and it basically gets the ID, ID off the smart card. It checks it. Um, if it's an existing ID, it will notify the poll official that it's been used before. Otherwise, it will allow everything else, you know, all the voting messages to take place as normal. And again, you see this use of this sequence point, got this any there. Um, OK. So that was a kind of very quick um, overview of, of what we've, we've done here. Um, that's the kind of summary of it. Um, just to kind of wrap up by saying that um, I, I think now this, this matter tool, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a nice unified way of doing this aspect-oriented model. And we've applied it to multiple different situations. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done on the kind of bigger question of you know, for real development um, scenarios. Um, is it a good idea to kind of separate out all these different concerns and then put these concerns back together? Um, you know, does that really work in practice? I think is still you know one of the the interesting questions still to be looked at. Um, and I'll stop there and take any questions. Um, these misuse cases don't seem to be particularly oriented to security. Do you think you could use them for um, like specifying safety properties in general, like um, something that you don't want to happen in the in the system? And yeah, you could. In fact, that? when when misuse cases were first invented, they weren't invented specifically for security. It's just they they have a very natural interpretation in that world, and so that's where they've tended to be used more. But yeah, they, they're more general than that. Um, I, I jump in. Sorry. Um, what do you do with concerns or aspects which don't readily um, lend themselves to, to be functional aspects? So like performance, for example. Right. I um, mean, they, they, they help to guide the design process, and uh, but they are important aspects. And, Right, yeah. The, the, we, I mean, the short answer is we, would, we wouldn't directly handle something like that. Um, you know, you would have to operationalize it first. Um, so, I mean, most, most of these things that we normally consider as non-functional requirements, though, when you actually come to do a design, you'd end up operationalizing them. Um, you know, uh, performance, not necessarily, although even with performance, you might do so by, you know, having some optimization algorithms or something. So, so we're, we're assuming that, you know, whatever it is you want to model, you're, you're going to operationalize it first. Yeah. So you, you showed that uh, sometimes uh, multiple of these uh, uh, graph transformations may conflict, and you say you could do a critical pair analysis. I would wonder whether you would like to have uh, control structures that say apply these one first and then apply those. Uh, do you support that already? 
Um, yes, well, we do, but not as well as we would like. So right now, we just have a, a simple attribute um, within the models where you can specify, you know, an integer that says the order. Um, you could get much more fancy and, you know, for example, have an, an activity diagram where you have, you know, full control flow. But no, we don't, we don't have that level of support yet. Okay. Thank you very much.